Welcome everyone to our next lecture on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. We continue with section 7, okay? We haven't finished it. So there's lots of material in this section. We introduced a couple of more distributions. Distributions for dice, for example, and for throwing dice several times. And then the more challenging stuff were Dirichlet distribution and beta distribution. Because those were now um, distributions not for modeling something that we experience in the world, like throwing a dice or something, but it was about the parameters of modeling something that we experience in the real world. However, being Bayesian, and we have very often a Bayesian hat on, yeah, I also want to have my parameters, uh, I also want my parameters to be random variables, okay, and I want to do probabilistic inference about them. And we've seen last time with this example with these online sellers that it could be a nice thing actually to model the parameters probabilistically as well because who cares for point estimates we want to make decisions we want to know whether one seller is better than the other and we don't care for the exact parameters of, um, of, of the, uh, the exact means or the exact point estimates we are more interested in the distribution so which also takes into account how much data we have seen okay somehow typically point estimates they are agnostic about the number of data points that we've seen, but when you have the posterior distribution, the variance typically captures that. We've seen that for the Gaussian distribution that the variance gets more narrow the more data points we've seen, and the same happening for the beta distribution as well. And then that can be taken into account, so there's a bigger spread of possibilities, and then depending on your questions, this will change the outcome at the end, instead of just comparing like a point estimate for seller one, which was maybe 90% from 100 reviews, and 100% from seller two, which were only two reviews, okay? And there's a number really plays a role, and it's encoded in the posterior distribution. Okay, now let's look at other things, and this is now about transformation of random variables. By the way, maybe before this lecture on machine learning, random variables wasn't such an important term for you, but random variables is basically the data, the description of the data in machine learning. So everything that could be pictures or it could be a questionnaire, everything we model in, our, in the back of our head as a random variable. And saying that, that some data is a random variable basically means that we could have measurements of it and there are some distributions about these random variables. Sometimes we can write down the distribution, sometimes we cannot. <laughs> Right? If you have a super complicated image data set of bedrooms or something and you want to create a generative adversarial network or whatever, it's fine to think about the bedrooms as a point cloud and in a way there might be a high dimensional density, so it's a good way to think about it, but this thinking might not lead now to a, a valid approach to really model the distribution, but instead you just do energy-based neural networks or something. Nonetheless, I think it's Good, or that's my way of thinking probabilistically that there is a random variable that in principle could be modeled and if I'm doing something else I'm kind of approximating the ideal right because that's only computational that's the only thing that's computationally feasible and really to do it probabilistically with base rule might not be possible but in principle that might be the right way to do if we could do it so random variables are very central and so in a way, if I write a Python program and I declare a variable, which I give a value, now a random variable is a value that also possibly carries a distribution, right? And not really a value, but only carries a distribution. And so it's interesting to ask, so now if I transform a random variable, so how does the distribution change, okay? And we've seen already some transformations in the lecture about Gaussian distributions. Does anyone remember the transformations we looked at? We didn't call them transformations, those were mappings of vectors that are multivariate Gaussian distributed. Any ideas? What were these transformations? We looked at linear affine transformations. So we said, given a Gaussian vector, so a random variable or a random vector with a multivariate Gaussian distribution, how does the distribution change if we apply a linear transformation to that vector? And there we had a theorem or a lemma that basically it's again a Gaussian distribution but the covariance structure changes. Yeah? And when you think about linear mappings, um, I like this three blue, one brown something videos on, on YouTube. You might like them too. So they're really great for linear algebra. And I watch them too. 
Yeah? I, I know linear algebra, but I really like these visualizations and I learn a lot from it. So you see that somehow the, the, the space is shifted around and sheared and flipped and all these things. And so that is the transformation of the whole space. And now if you think of a Gaussian distribution first like a soccer ball, something circular, okay, so isotropic, like a physician would say, so any direction is the same kind of. And then you do a linear transformation to the space, you can turn a soccer ball into a cigar. And that corresponds to changing the covariance matrix, okay? However, it's still a Gaussian distribution. And then if you do an affine linear mapping, affine, affine basically means that you can also shift the whole space by a vector, okay? And that, of course, changes the mean of the Gaussian distribution. So those are transformation of random variables. Um, what are other transformations? So in principle, every input-output program, let's take a neural network that takes a vector in, does some nonlinearities and some linear mappings or convolutions or some whatever, some attention layers or you name it, normalization layers, and at the end there's another vector. Then that is a computer program and it's a transformation as well. And so it's curious to ask, so if we care for random variables, so how does the distribution change from the input to the output. Yeah? Can we describe it with mathematics as well? And the answer is, no, unfortunately, if it's very high dimensional, that's quite difficult. There are ways to do it, but there are some special cases which, which I couldn't find material on. But we will look at the one-dimensional case. So we have a univariate random variable, gamma distributed or whatever, and we apply transformation, and then we want to derive the density. And the question is how to do it, okay? And that's what we are looking at next. Okay, so how does the transformation change the PDF? So the PDF is a description of our distribution, okay? So let's look at the case. We are given a random variable already, okay? So that one here, so how can I mark it? So we have a random variable. Again, this is a notation with the tilde, a random variable distributed according to a density in this case, yeah? And we have another random variable that is defined in terms of the first random variable by using some transformation where the transformation is now just some function. It could be a little Python program or a little Python function, or it could be whatever. It could be a sequence on a calculator, or it could be uh, a neural network or whatever that goes from the range of x, which is typically the real numbers in this case, to the range of z, which is also the real numbers, okay? And now the question is, having done this transformation now, what is the density p sub z, okay? And here now I'm using these sub-indices on my PDFs. And that's very handy because then I can, for example, plug into the PDF of Z, I can plug in X or something, transformation of X or something, and it's immediately, immediately clear what function I'm talking about. So what is a desideratum? First of all, what is a desideratum? Des that is something we desire, yeah? something that we want, so something that would be nice, okay? And we say a transformation is a deterministic mapping, okay? If there's an input, we always get the same output. Of course, in computer science, that's not always the case, right? There are some weird functions like random, uh, like random in Python that generates random numbers. Or we could I have input, we call input inside a Python function, and then the output will be different with each call depending on the input. So there could be side effects, and it could depend on some other state. But if we assume that a transformation in principle is like side effect free and it doesn't have a state, it's just a deterministic function. So something that would be nice if, is if, if we calculate probabilities yeah, with respect to the density of x, for example, being in a certain interval, yeah, now we transform everything yeah, to, the, to the other world in the world of z, then basically the probability should stay the same. Yeah? Nothing should change here. And um, basically now here I could plug in for the t of x, I can plug in the z. Yeah? But note that we also change the, the bounds here of these things. Okay? This gives you already a hint now what now plays a role. And that basically answers the question how we should change this transformation. So maybe you've seen this t of a and t of b already yeah? by integration of, um, what is it, substitution rule for integration. There's also this weird thing that you change the variable, the dx, into a dz, yes, and then suddenly 
You also change the bounds from A to B. Now it's T of A and T of B. You might have seen this. And you will see it now on the slide. Okay? So it has something to do with integration by substitution. So let's write it out. I mean, these probabilities are integrals. Okay? So let's write them out. This is the integral over the density of X from A to B. Okay? Now the first step over here, going from the first step to the second one, um, that is what we want. We want that the change probability over here, uh, or the, cha the transformed random variable, should create the same probability. So if the probability being between A and B is a half, yeah, then also Z between T A and T B should be also a half. Okay, should be the same numbers. So that is basically the first equality. That's our desideratum. Okay, what we want. And now what about the second one? The second one is integration by substitution. Okay. We are just replacing the dz by a dx. But when you do this, when you replace the dz by the dx, somehow you need to put the derivative of the transformation in here. Okay? And the bounds change now to a and b, which makes sense because now I'm again integrating over dx. Okay, so that's kind of the mass. And if we now look for the px, x, and here we have another, another expression that has the x, then we can kind of read off now the density of x in terms of z. Okay, it's unfortunately the wrong way around, but this is something, right? So we are getting closer. So let's start again. So we have a monotonically increasing or monotonically non-decreasing transformation. Yeah, the non-decreasingness is something I haven't talked about it, but that was important to say that if a is less than or equal to x, less than or equal to b, if the ordering here stays the same, yeah, then t must be non-decreasing. Yeah, if, if t is multiplication with minus 1, then all these inequalities would flip. Okay? So here we assume that. In general, we don't need it, but for the nice mass here on the slide, we need it. Okay. And um, so this thing will have a derivative, which is something positive. Fine. And by the integration by substitution, we know that the density of z yeah, applied to the input of the transformed x must be multiplied with the derivative of t. Okay? And so now we have a formula for px in terms of pz, which is almost what we want. Okay? But it shows nicely the relation to the integration by substitution rule, that this is really it. That is the reason why we have this term. I'm not sure. Have you seen this transformation rule already in, in some Murphy lectures? Yes. And typically there's a, a lot of to the minus one involved. And here we don't have it because we do it the wrong way around. Okay, so let's do it the right way around. Oh yeah, just as a note, so I wrote it with an absolute value. I told you already the absolute value is there because um, it could be a decreasing function and if it's a decreasing function then we should only take the absolute value because it's only about the change of volume. It's not about the sign. Okay, now let's do it the other way around. We found that um, if x is a random variable and z is a transformed variable, we got this formula. Nice. So let's do it backwards. Let's say t is invertible. So that means there exists a function t to the minus 1, yeah, such that t inverts t to the minus 1 inverts t, and t inverts t to the minus 1. Okay? And then if we defined x to be t to the minus 1 of z, then we just get this formula. And that is the one that is familiar, I guess, from previous lectures. Right? So typically you start with x having a certain density, z being a transformed version of x, and then you get this formula over there for the pz. Okay? But there's this confusing t to the minus 1 thing in here. But now you know why it's in here. Okay? So first of all, I wanted to show you, so why do we get this derivative? We get it because the, integra the integral should stay the same. And integration by substitution exactly requires here putting in this derivative in here. Why is it minus 1? Yes, because actually we did it the wrong way around. So that's why we have the minus 1 in here. OK, and that's also why we need the subindex x here, because the input is kind of some function of z. And so it wouldn't be clear what density we are talking about. But this is really the density that is given at the beginning. Let's summarize it in a nice theorem. So here's a nice theorem. So if we have a random variable s before and a transformed random variable s before, 
and we have some transformation here, okay? Let's say it's monotonic, so it should be written in here. Anyway, then the PDFs are related as follows, and let's just write down both of them, okay? Because it's handy and it kind of shows where the formulas come from. Very nice. Um, how could you remember these, these things? So, an easy way to remember is the following, is using Leibniz notation. Yeah, so Leibniz notation for derivatives is this thing down here. So instead of talking about t of x, we could also say we have a variable z. And so we could talk about dz, which is now a small, um, a small interval in the output space, so in the result space of the transformation. So we compare how is the little volume element in my output compared to a little volume element in my input. What is the ratio? And that is exactly the derivative, right? That's also how it's defined. Of course, this is more looking like these, I'm not sure, are you familiar with non-standard non -standard analysis? So that's something the logicians like, that's like the real numbers, and you have some additional numbers which are epsilon, which are smaller than all other real numbers. Sounds weird, but it's possible. And then you can have really defined derivatives like that. So in Leibniz notation. But that's not the common way like you learn it in Murphy or in Infini. Anyway, so why am I telling you this? Because now if I plug in the, um, the dz divided by dx in here, yeah, uh, then basically the dx from here will cancel out with the dx down here and I will end up with almost the right formula. Okay, So it's like saying that uh, in order to rewrite the... I, I can do it once on the board, so let's do it once on the board. So suppose I'm, ha I'm having an integral um, from A to B. And now I, I want to say, okay, I want to um, change my variable x back here. Okay, how am I doing it? I'm just extending it with um, dz divided by dz, okay? So in non-standard analysis, those are infinitely small numbers. In general, this is Leibniz notation. And then we move that one over there. Yeah? So we have dx divided by dz. And that is exactly now the derivative of the inverse transformation. Yeah? However, it's a bit shaky. Because now, what is the input here? So here's something weird, and here's something weird. So it's a bit hand wavy, this kind of trick. OK? But dx divided by dz expects something uh, from the space of z, right? So of course, in here must be uh, the inverse of z. And then over here, you will also have that one. So these changes are a bit hand wavy. Yeah? But the general thing to remember is integral should stay the same. So if integral stays the same, we need that is the same. And now if you want to have a formula of p of z, you got it. And this is the derivative. Yeah? And if you want to have it the other way around, then you get the other one. OK? So the notation is giving us not the super rigorous formula. You still need to do some thinking of what the right input is. But it's a shortcut, OK, to remember it. Having the idea integral should stay the same. Another way of seeing this is this is the product, right? So these are little rectangles here, right? So the p of x is some length, and the delta x is a different length, and we are multiplying it. And that's an area. And so this area under the curve should be the same as this area under the curve. OK, that's another way to think about it. Areas should stay the same. So densities must change if I have a nonlinear transformation. OK, so far so good. Um, uh, here's yet another way to write it down. This is from previous slides. And I like this version better. But I kept it in here. So that's the same thing, but now the z is called y. And this is another way to say, OK, little y of x, so y is the question. OK, question? Uh, 
of t of x? Yeah. Um, no, not necessarily. So did I understand correctly? You are asking whether t of x is equal to the derivative of t of x, right? No, no, no. Well, the derivative of t of x is equal to t of x. The derivative of t of x, this one, yes. is uh, equal to t of x. This one? Yes. No, not at all. Totally different things. So let me uh, repeat. So p of x is a density function. That is a PDF. It's all positive, and it integrates to 1. Okay. p z is also a PDF. It's all positive. It integrates to 1. t of x is any transformation. Could be any function. Could be x squared. Could be logarithm of x. Could be logarithm of x minus 17, or whatever. It could be any function. Could be a neural network. Could be anything. Okay, so basically, this is describing something random. Yeah, it's a distribution. The t is a deterministic function, so that is really fixed. And now the question is, instead of only transforming a single value, right? We implement t typically by saying, okay, if x is five, then now I'm saying logarithm of five minus seventeen, and I get another value. I'm now asking the question, can I get like? Can I get it simultaneously for all values at the same time by saying, so can I transform my density in such a way that, so now how does the density change um, under this transformation? Okay, so the different things. Yes, or more precisely, the result of the transformation here is another random variable, and that random variable has another PDF. Okay. Yeah, okay, but um, it's good that you ask. Um, maybe there's another interesting thing to think about it. Let's say we start with a Gaussian distribution. And now, what can we do with the transformation? So how could we change it? Let's think of some fun way to change this distribution. Could we change it in a way that the maximum is suddenly over here? Could we do this? Any ideas? How could we do it? Yeah? Just shift it, right? So it could be um, x probably minus 2, maybe plus 2, but I think minus is, is correct because then if I'm here, let's say I'm having a 5, and then I say 5 minus x, then I'm right over here at the 3, and I will have the highest value. Yeah? Okay, we can do that. Could we also have, now we have one bump, could we have a transformation that gives us two bumps? Is that also possible? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, okay. Could be, could be true. Other opinions? <laughs> of course, if I'm asking for other opinions, it is possible. So um, it's right that one needs to be careful because we restricted our t here yeah, to be monotonic. However, I think one can do it by kind of accumulating here, pushing lots of material together over here. So let's see how a transformation would look like. So the transformation, so first of all, let's say this is x, OK? And this is px. And so this is now our z or y, whatever. And this is our pz. So let's see whether we get something like this, OK? How would the transformation look like? Um, in principle, we could keep it just for this from here to here. We could just keep it monotonically, OK? So let's draw it in here as well. So this is also now a plot of t of x. So we would just do it like linearly increasing. So just the identity, OK? Just the identity function. So this is all the same. But now here, we want to concentrate more material from very large numbers. OK, so how can we do that? We could do it by. Now letting this thing going flat. OK, and now what's happening here is that all the stuff that is back here, all the, the volume kind of get, gets mapped to a very small interval, to a finite interval. So let's say I'm letting it converge against a finite number. So my transformation is here going against a finite number. That would mean that it will collect all the material that is going up to infinity and 
push it all into this interval. Okay, and by this, I could get this even like this. Okay, and this bump could go higher than the other one. Okay? Yeah, it's non-intuitive, but maybe it's, it's good to see what's possible. And this is a monotonically increasing function. But it can uh, stauchen. I don't know, what is it in English? Stauchen? So, stretching something? What, what is it? Squeeze. Squeeze sounds great. So I can squeeze the interval from 5 to infinity. I can squeeze it into this little interval. And this, then the bump could go up. Yeah? Okay, great. So again, let me stress, it's, it's good if you ask questions, right? It motivates me to go to the board, yeah? no matter what the question is. And I can, sometimes I can come up with new, new examples here. This one? You mean what the what the what would I have to write down here? Okay, good question. Um, I want a function that goes that converges against the constant, right? So what function would converge against the constant? Any ideas? Something with the e function. Okay, yeah. e to the minus x, so that's already a nice one. So it's basically one that goes like this, right? That converges to 0. So let's take e to the minus x plus 2. OK? And then I have it shifted up to 2. And I could do it in such a way that I say, OK, it's defined up to here. It's defined like that. And here I'm taking the derivative of the e function, which is 1, right? e to the 0 is 1. And I'm just letting it linearly going up, for example. And then I define the function with an if then else, or with either some brackets, or however I like it, OK? Yeah, so that, that would be a practical function. Another, would, another representation of this function would be, oh, I just write down a big table. I make a big table. And then I say, OK, everything above 100 is constant. And between the, I do linear interpolations, and I have little bumps even in here. It's not even differentiable, but it's monotonically increasing. So many possibilities. OK, good questions. Um, so this is the other way of writing things down. Yeah? I could also say y of x is a monotonically increasing function of x. And the confusing thing here might be, Huh, why? Now, is y a variable or is it a function? Right? But this is like these physicist-style notation. Sometimes they define a variable which depends on another variable, but which is just another way of saying y is equal to f of x. But when in school you learn y is equal to f of x, you are using way too many symbols, right? Why not replace the f by y, right? So y of x is also another way to write things down. So this is the same formula as before, just using slightly different notation. However, the fun part here in, on this theorem is these capital letter and small letter things, OK? So y of little x is a monotonic function. Yeah? Um, a way to say that it's invertible is that this little x of little y is also existing, right? So that's now a short way to say that. And then we could say now capital Y is a new random variable, and it's defined to be little y of capital X. And by plugging in a random variable now, yeah, we get a new random variable. Okay? And then again, we have a, the same transformation formula, which this, the last notes here, they say the same stuff as we've seen before. Okay? It's a bit redundant. Let's look at a super simple example. Okay? And um, I, we can do it on the board. That might be good. So let me first copy it. And then, so x is distributed according to some distribution p of x, which is not more specified. And then sometimes we would write, so this thing is now p of y, or sometimes we would even write x given y is whatever, something like this. So these notations are all possible. In our case now, we will write y is equal, so it's a deterministic function, being the logarithm of x. OK, 
Okay, and now the question is, so now everyone can see it. I'm over here. Now the question is, um, what is the PDF of Y? Okay, and now without having all these formulas in my head, how would I start? Without looking at the formula collection, I would first write down my little shortcut, which was this one. So this is a formula to remember. And this formula you remember because you're saying integral should stay the same, probability should stay the same. And then I say, OK, what do I need? I need the one for the PY. OK, so I need a formula for the PY, which is something like PX times DX by DY. OK, interesting. So I need this function x of y. But I have the function y of x. So let's derive the uh, other way around. And the other way around is just that x is equal to x of y. OK, so this is the inverse. Um, nicely, the, then the derivative, I can also write it with a little x of y and putting here a little y. Because now then I can also say, OK, now what is dx dy? And we all know, though, this is also x of y. Now we could become a little bit more precise. So this derivative has an input y which is then over there, OK? So this makes the notation a bit clo uh, more clear. So we have already that expression over there. Now what about these guys? OK, I, I want a density of little y. Yeah, So it should be a function of little y. Now what can I plug in over there? Um, so it should be something from the range of x. And I'm starting with the y. So I probably need to plug in the x of y in here, OK? So I plug in the x of y. Great. Uh, let's continue. So the x of y was the e to the y. So it's p capital X x of y. OK, so far so good. Times the derivative. OK, great. That's how it is. Now you might think, but is it really a density, right? I mean, we just did some transformations. But if it's a density, it must be always positive. OK, the p of x is always positive. e to the something is always positive. Oh, this is good. This is already lucky. Um, now what about integrating it to 1? This looks more scary. Um, so I'm talking about. By the way, this is a capital Y. I hope you recognize that one. So that one should be equal to 1. OK? And um, let's plug it all in. It's the integral of px e to the y times e to the y uh, dy. And now I, I would need more, more space. Let me just tell you. Now I'm doing integration by substitution backwards. And I'm done. Yeah? That's just how the whole rule was defined. Yeah, the whole rule was this weird rule just popped out of this thing of integration by substitution. That was just perfectly designed so that it fits. So this is the derivative that is required for integration by substitution. Of course, let me put a bang on here. So bang meaning you need to prove it, you need to show it, to really believe it, right? So I couldn't see it just by looking. I would have to write down now the transformation and blah, 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 blah. We have it over here, OK? OK, so this is an example. Why? I mean, it's not looking simple, right? It looks kind of a bit scary. But then at the end, um, the difficulty here lies only in what do you plug into these different functions, and when do you take the inverse, and when you don't. So that's the only difficulty. The functions are yeah, usually simple. By the way, if you're an exam, yeah, written exam, and you get this, and then you ask the question, Sorry, I, I really don't know what is the inverse function of the logarithm. Yeah? No problem. 
then we will tell everyone, by the way, the inverse of the logarithm is the exponential function, and you can continue. So that is not something we are testing. That's not something we want to know from you. Um, just that you know how to do it. But um, you can ask us, what is the derivative of 1 divided by x, right? Does anyone know, by the way? Oh, that's a simple one. Sorry. I, I, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a simple one. I am, okay, I gave it away already. I wanted to ask, what's the derivative of the logarithm? So and that is 1 divided by x. Yeah, that's a weird thing. Why is it 1 divided by x? Yeah. So these kind of things you can ask us, no problem. Okay, that is a simple, simple, somewhat simple example. So the informal function to, formula to remember is that one, okay? Volume stays the same. Here's another interesting theorem, the rule of the unconscious statistician. Yeah? Unconscious is like also another, uh, so it's also sometimes called lazy. There's a really nice book from Larry Wasserman, who's a, um, like he's really a hardcore statistician person, and he wrote a really nice book called All of Statistics, which I really like a lot. So it's a book, it's pink, it's, um, it's from Springer, I think, so it's a real math book, so it's really, so it contains the facts, so Larry Wasserman, he's a real statistician. It's really nice, and it's showing you all of statistics without the proofs. So you see all the theorems, lots of stuff, and very well explained, yeah? The only disappointment of this book is that suddenly there came another book, which was called All of non parametric Statistics, and then I thought, man, I bought it already for 80 euros, it's All of Statistics, I thought that is all. And then there's another one, so that was a kind of disappointment. But both books are really nice. Yeah? Anyway, so he calls this rule the lazy statistician, so the rule of the lazy statistician. So let's look why, what's, the, what's the deal here. So suppose we are given a random variable with a given PDF, and we have some transformation, some function of x. Yeah? And now we want to have the expectation of random variable y. Yeah? So how would you do it? The non-lazy more stupid statistician would use the transformation of variable formula, would derive the PDF, and then calculate the integration. The lazy statistician just uses this formula. So curiously, the expectation of y is just the expectation of the transformed x. And so why is that a nice formula here? Because here the random variable is x, so the integral is only with respect to p of x. So there's no need to derive the PDF of y. If you're just interested in the expectation, then the formula is super easy. Okay, and again, the proof here is, you guessed it, the key is integration by substitution. It's all designed around integration by substitution. Okay, that's it basically. Okay, so the first one is the definition of the expectation. The second equality, it is integration by substitution. Okay. And why is it that? Because, okay, we integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity, so we don't have to worry about transforming the minus infinity and plus infinity if we have a function that goes from both ends, okay? And then the derivative that you usually have by integration by substitution is kind of um, put into here, so the p of x is kind of having it in there. Or the other way around, if you use the rule backwards, it would be in p of y. Okay, if you want to read more about it, there's a, there's a Wikipedia page on this rule, which might give you some more details. Yeah? But it's, it's interesting. So let's say you have a big neural network, like a really one with, uh, big one with thousand layers, yeah? and super complicated attention head and blah, blah, blah mechanisms in there, skip connections, maybe fractal substructures, whatever. And you want to calculate the expectation of the output. Yeah? How do you do it? You, you just generate data from the input distribution, which is given, right, because we are talking about a random variable as the input. You generate data from the input distribution, you move it through the network, and then you calculate the average at the end. Okay, and that's it. No worry about densities or anything. Of course, it is a bit an exaggeration, because neural networks are usually high dimensional, right? You have a 100 dimensional input, you have a 10 dimensional output. Do these all this integration by substitution, does it really work in these higher dimensions? Actually, I must say, I don't know. But I think it's a good guess to use the rule of the lazy statistician. Yeah? But that's something uh, that is a bit unclear. But I think it should work. Yeah. 
Good, so far so good. Let's look at another example. So this one is a bit more involved, yeah? But let me tell you immediately, so the most difficult part of this derivation is that my random variable is called pi. Okay, so that's the most confusing part. But pi is a Greek letter, and it's not only 3.141563, no, 1415926536 something. How far can you do it? Anyway, um, so p is just a random number here. It's just a, just a real number, and there is, there's a capital Greek letter which I didn't use here. So this is really a function of a little real number. And it's a parameter of some Bernoulli distribution. Right? So it's distributed according to some beta distribution. So with these two parameters, a and b, as always, that is just the density. OK, let's change our parameterization yeah, of my Bernoulli distribution. Let's change it by transforming pi. So here's the transformation. I'm taking the logarithm of pi divided by 1 minus pi. And that looks like a strange transformation. Um, but when you see the inverse, maybe it's not that strange anymore. So that's just a sigmoid function, yeah, which you might have heard of in neural networks. So let me plot it for you, the pi of x, OK? So the pi of x is just, um, oh, where's the super duper eraser? Is it gone? Anyone sees it? Oh, it's gone. OK, so let's, let's use another chalkboard then. OK, so I'm talking about x of uh, pi of x. OK, so this is x, this is pi of x, and the pi of x is 1 divided by 1 plus e to the minus x. So did I copy it right? Yeah, so it's that one. So if you've never seen it, OK, so let's try to plot it together. Yeah. Um, Let's see what's happening for x is going to infinity. Okay, if x is going to infinity, we have e to the minus x, which is zero. Okay, and we get one divided by one. Okay, so somehow the whole thing will somehow converge against one. What about zero? I have e to the zero, which is um, one. So I have a half, one half. Okay, so I'm hitting over here. And what's happening against minus infinity? Um, minus infinity will be uh, e to the plus infinity, which is infinity. So I have 1 divided by infinity, which is 0. OK, so the whole function looks like this. And this is the so-called sigmoidal function, or, or sigmoid. Uh, and it will pop up in your network. So that's a typical nonlinearity that you put between the linear layers. Yeah? So basically, it's kind of compressing some value from minus infinity and plus infinity, it's compressing it to the interval between 0 and 1. OK, so that's the purpose. There's another one that you might know. There's the tangent hyperbolicus. And you don't have to know anything about the hyperbolicus version. That's something I think you'd never learn in school. But it's just another function which looks very similar, but it's crossing it at the 0. So it's like the sigmoidal function. But um, that's just as an aside for the neural networks fans among you, OK? So that is the sigmoidal function. OK, interesting. So let's see, um, what if we take the inverse? So what if we have x of pi, OK? So here we have now pi. Um, we just need to, I think, we mirror it here at the diagonal. And that basically means that we are going like this from 0 to 1, right? Here we are between 0 and 1. And so it's defined like that. And it's now not defined for the other values. OK? And it also has some weird expression, which we've seen on the slide. However, the pi was now something which uh, was distributed according to a beta distribution. So it's only defined between 0 and 1. Yeah? So it's only defined on this interval. So we see that this transformation, x of pi, is transforming our parameter from the interval between 0 and 1. Yeah, it's transforming it to minus infinity and plus infinity. 
Now let's see what's happening to the beta distribution, right? So that's now the interesting question. So how does the density change? Okay, here's the answer. So p of x um, is distributed according to our super duper transformation formula. Yeah. So the first part here is the distribution of my pi, which is just a better distribution. However, I plugged in already the pi of x. That's very much like what I did over here, where I plugged in the x of y into the density of x. Okay, it's the same thing. Now I'm plugging in the p of pi of x. Okay, great. Times the derivative. I omitted the absolute value because my function is monotonically increasing. Yeah? If it's monotonically increasing, the derivative is positive, and I don't care for any minus signs. Okay, nice. Now let's calculate the derivative here that is required. And there, actually, there's some fun thing. You can derive the derivative of pi to be pi of x times 1 minus pi of x. Yeah? And why does it look so nice? Because there's the e function involved. Uh, you know the derivative of the e function is the e function itself. The de derivative of the e function with the minus x is always flipping signs, right? And then the other transformation is putting some more symmetry and stuff in here. So it will be pi of x times 1 minus pi of x. Okay? So practically speaking, so <clears throat> that means the derivative right at the zero, yeah, we know that pi of a half is, uh, pi of zero is one half, and one minus one half is also a half, so it will be one quarter. So this is the derivative over here, one quarter. And for example, for larger numbers, I will have um, something that goes close to one, so I will have pi of x is equal to, almost equal to one, and something which is very small, which is one minus this number very small to one. So it gets very flat gets towards zero. The same thing if I go to minus infinity, then the one minus pi of x is close to one, okay? And the other term is getting close to zero, okay? So the derivative is always positive, and it has its maximum right here, yeah? And towards here it's going towards zero, and here it's also going towards zero. So the derivative is basically, I can also draw it in here. It's this guy, okay? So here's one quarter. This is one half. Okay, and nobody can see it. Okay, what I just drawn was this little bump here. Yeah, that is basically the derivative of my sigmoidal function. Maybe this is more detail than you really want to know, but um, we also will use it uh, for neural networks at some point. Anyway, so this is like a nice form, and the, the, to derive this formula, you use some tricks of the E function. Question? Ah, no, no, you just ask us. So we are not asking you for derivatives. I mean, we would expect that you know the derivative of the logarithm to be 1 divided by x, so these kind of tricks. But then if you are blocked by a question like that, which actually belongs to Murphy, that's fine. Just ask us. Yeah? If in doubt, just ask us. That's fine. And then we will say, no, no, we won't tell you the Gaussian distribution, so that's too much. So you should know it. Okay? But I guess after doing the exercises, you know the Gaussian distribution, maybe, because you've written it down several times. Okay, so anyway, so now we kind of derived the expression for that one. And if we first plug in the beta distribution, we have already this pi of x to something and 1 minus pi of x to something. So it looks super natural to multiply another pi of x yeah, from, the, from the right. And so it's just changing the exponent over here. However, note that this is not a beta distribution any more like before, because now the input is not the pi to the power of a, but some nonlinear function of x to the power of a. Yeah? However, this thing uh, is also normalized. If you integrate it over the x, it will also be properly normalized, even though there's not an a minus 1 and a b minus 1 in here. Right? The reason being, pi of x is nonlinear transforming the x in such a way that everything works. Okay, so I derived the p of x. Nice. And now comes the surprising thing. So I said the p of x 
the density of x of the transformed variable is defined in such a way yeah, that the integrals like probability stay the same. What about things like the expectation or modes or other things? I've shown you already an example over here that by transforming a random variable you can generate more modes. Yeah? However, it would be an, a curious question. Now, um, suppose uh, uh, my better distribution of the pi has a certain mode. Okay, so there's a certain, so let's say this is my beta distribution, okay, and that was my, that was my posterior distribution after seeing some data, okay? Now I'm saying, so now what's happening if I'm transforming it to a, and so this is pi, okay, and this is p of pi, I'm transforming it to x of pi, yeah? Then now I'm wondering, so what can happen? to my estimate. So that was my map estimate. It's the mode. Yeah? Or I could have a, um, uh, this, this mean could be also my estimate if I have an L2 error, for example, or I could take the median. What happens to these estimates? Are they consistent? So it would be nice if now the, um, the mode of x of pi, yeah? if that would be just, x of the mode of pi, right? So that would be a nice property. Or the mean, that that is just x of the mean of pi. OK, so that would be so nice if that is true, right? Um, however, as you know, the expectation is a linear operator, yeah? So it doesn't commute with nonlinear functions necessarily. It only commutes with linear functions. So this is not the case. And actually, as we've seen, you can do lots of fun stuff with the bumps and create new ones. You could also spread this bump and make it really flat and generate at another location another bump. Also, this doesn't hold. So both are wrong, OK? Now, why is that a big deal? Because it means if you have a map estimate, it depends on the parameterization of your parameter. So if you parameterize your beta distribution with the pi, your map estimate might be over here. But if you reparameterize the parameter with a deterministic function, but you just reparameterize the parameter, then suddenly the map estimate is changing, right? How weird is that, right? The data is the same, everything is the same. Now we are just rewrote your parameter with a nonlinear function and the map estimate changes. So that's why map estimation is sometimes considered to be dangerous because it depends on the, it might be intuitive to say, yeah, that is the one, the largest one, that's the one I take, but that's very arbitrary and it depends very much on how you parameterize your stuff. So I have a couple of slides on that one. So anyway, so that is the derivation here. So what did I derive? I, do, I, have a, I have a beta distribution up here for my pi. I have some lookalike beta distribution for my parameter x, which is just a deterministic transformation of the pi. Let's compare the means. So there's a formula to calculate the mean of my beta distribution, which is just a divided by a plus b. Yeah, you might remember the parameters a is like how many times have I seen glasses, and b is how many times didn't I have C glasses? So this is just like a, like a Bernoulli parameter type of thing. And if you calculate the, the mean of um, the x yeah, of the transformed distribution, you get something super complicated. I show you on the next slide approximately how to do it. Yeah? But you get something complicated. And it turns out it's not the logarithm of, or it's not the transformed version of a plus b, which would be logarithm of a divided by b. So where does the logarithm of a divided by b now come from? It's coming from um, plugging the mean from this distribution, which is a divided by a plus b, plugging it into this formula. OK? So when you plug in for the pi now a divided by a plus b, then you should get this one. I guess you like to see these ca calculations, right? So let me show you that it's really the case. So. Um, logarithm of expectation of pi divided by 1 minus expectation of pi. Oh, let's, uh, I prefer that one. So is that the right formula approximately? Yes, it is. 
And now we had the expectation was a divided by a plus b divided by 1 minus this guy and 1 minus this guy is just b divided by a plus b, right? So 1 minus the top thing is just b divided by a plus b. And then you cross it out and you get logarithm of a divided by b. Unfortunately, that is not the same as this um, expectation. The calculation of that expectation is a bit involved. I show you and give you hints. However, I'm not assuming that you are able to do this, right? You may be able to, I, it took me an afternoon to figure it out, yeah? So I really had to look up a lot of pages. So to calculate this one, you need the so-called d gamma function, right? And now you think Professor Hamling really likes these weird functions. I, I'm just throwing them at you and say, don't worry, they are just names and they pop up but we don't have to understand many details of them. We just have to have, we can use them like constants. They are already implemented for us, so we don't worry about them. Anyway, so it can be expressed using the digamma function, and the digamma function is the derivative of the logarithm of the gamma function. Why, right? Why this expression, right? I have no idea, but it's the one that answers our question, okay? So that's, that someone figured it out. And I don't know, do you know this? Steganowitz and blah, 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 book of functions. So that's a super big book, which is basically full of these kind of functions. And some people have figured them all out for us. We can just use them. Anyway, so this is just, I wanted to know now what is exactly the expectation of um, the x, yeah? And it is this one, okay? However, that one is different from the logarithm of a divided of b. It's a different one, okay? So to make a long story short, if you use map estimation, yeah, taking the mode of your posterior distribution, then the answer depends on the exact parameterization that you're using, right? If you parameterize with a parameter pi on the interval 0 to 1, you will get a different mode, a different maximum in your posterior distribution than if you make a nonlinear transformation of your parameter, then you get a different answer. Okay, that's why map is sometimes considered to be dangerous. Now the confusing thing here is for me, however, didn't we say something about probabilities should stay the same, so integral should stay the same? Wasn't the whole thing designed around this story, right? Um, yes, but the expectation is something slightly different. So the probability, say all of this shape, they look like that, okay? They integrate the density on some intervals or more general on some measurable event set, if you like measure theory, okay? However, okay, so this also still holds, so this would integrate to one, but now this is a totally different integral, okay? And now if you do integration by substitution, you have to take care of this guy as well. And that will change the outcome you will have a different derivative at the end, okay? So the expectation is calculating the integral with the density of some function which is non-constant. And since it's non-constant, it will change the output of the integration by substitution. So that's why it doesn't work, okay? Okay, so maybe for most of you that's already too much detail. So that's, I'm curious, why is it that way? So how does it work together? But it's already kind of advanced, I must admit. Similarly, okay, this was about the mean, right? But for the mode, we have a similar problem. I, I think I also, half of the time, I already talked about the mode now in the last five minutes. But um, so for both the mean and for the mode, mode, yeah, in both cases, we changed the result. And the mean was one of our nice estimators, right? So it was the, um, the, L2, was the L2 loss, yeah, the, the best estimator for the L2 loss and the mode was our map estimator, which was, uh, in principle, also something meaningful to do. However, now there's another one. There's also the median. So what about the median? Yeah? The median is fine. So the median doesn't pose any problems. Um, so why is that the case? Let's first ignore the stuff up here. So the, the median basically says that there's a location on my x-axis so that on the left-hand side I have 
0 0.5 of my PDF, and on the right-hand side, I have 0 0.5. And if I have a monotonic function, yeah, I will then also have a point in my transform variable where half of the weight is on the left-hand side and the other half is on the right-hand side. So, and that is exactly the map point. So for the median, everything is fine. Yeah? So to write it more um, mathematically, um, we could also say that the median is equivariant. Okay, that's a new word maybe for most of you. So that's something to look up. Yeah? So equivariant basically means if I take the median operation on the left-hand side of the equation, it's the same as doing the transformation of the median operation on the right-hand side of the equation. Yeah? Or with other words, the mean and the mode are not equivariant, which means the expectation of my transformed random variable is not the transformed mean. If that would be the case, then um, the mean would be equivariant with respect to arbitrary transformation. However, it's only equivariant with respect to linear transformation. Yeah? because that's the expectation is a linear operator. And similarly, the mode. So equivariant is now also an interesting notion, and you could compare it to invariance. Yeah? Basically, invariance says that um, the expectation of y is basically, now uh, whatever, you look it up. Yeah? So it's, there's, a, there's a difference between invariance and equivariance. And once you know it, you will see it in other places popping up too. OK, so far so good. End of section seven. Any questions about the transformation of variable stuff? So the, what's the skills? So now what is an exam question here in this topic, right? What could it be? Basically, here's the density, here's the transformation, do the calculation, right? Then we can check whether you know the transformation rule. Um, yeah, OK. Let me show you some uh, code. Do I have code on this one? Uh, what code do I have? Oh, I still have some code for the, um, OK, I don't have a code for the transformation of variable stuff. But last time, we rushed through our online seller example, right? And I just explained with words how to do it, OK? And I also have a little notebook on that one, OK? And it won't be the solution for your exercise. So I'm using different distributions, and so it will be something else. But they, again, you can see. So let me just repeat what the story was. So the story was we have two sellers, and for one we have 100 reviews, and for the other one we have only two reviews. And the whole point of this was that the whole distribution, the whole posterior distribution gives us information, right? And we shouldn't just use point estimates. And the actual question that we want to answer when we want to decide whether we buy at seller one or seller two is whether we trust seller one more than seller two. Okay, so that is our practical question. And then we can have the action, okay, I buy at seller one. So now how could we express it? Basically, we are asking now sampling from our posterior distributions from the beta, yeah? What is the probability that the first rating is larger than the second rating, okay? And it could be expressed by this integral. And of course, it looks dangerous and complicated and beta distribution and beta function all in here. However, the calculation is super easy if you do it numerically. So numerically, you just look at this joint density of the variables you are integrating over, and you are sampling examples of theta 1, theta 2, okay? So you create a big table of theta 1 and theta 2s, and then you're just asking for the proportion of the pairs where one is larger than the other. And that proportion will be 0 0.71, hopefully. If not, there's a typo, and you should tell me on the chat. OK, so let's look at a different example where we are computing some weird Gaussian integral. And let me first show you the Gaussian integral I want to compute. So where is it? So I need to run it again. So let's see. So I actually have a picture. OK, so this is a weird Gaussian integral. So what are we seeing? We are seeing two random variables, right? So the x is having something like a mean of 5 and some spread of 3 or 5, or I forgot it. And the y is another random variable with mean 2 and some spread. And I want to integrate 
this actually it's a continuous function, right? It's a continuous single hill. I want to integrate on this area over here, yeah? And of course, also this area I could express by a logical formula. So I can sample, and then I count the number of red dots inside this triangle and compare it with the total number of dots. And that is a good estimate for the integration. Wow, now can we do any high dimensional integration with this trick, right? Isn't that a super, super great method? No, unfortunately not, because let's say you are in a hundred dimension and you are sampling 1,000 data points, then these 1,000 data points are not very characteristic for the distribution. So there's the curse of dimensionality, which is another topic for another lecture. So in low dimensions, you can do this, yeah? In high dimensions, you can't. Okay, let's look at the implementation. So I'm, I like to use this rand function. That's a NumPy function which generates from a standard normal distributed random, univariate random variable. So it gives me samples from a Gaussian with mean zero and variance one, okay? And now how can we sample from an arbitrary Gaussian distribution? So mathematically speaking, my rand n from NumPy gives me samples from an n, n01 distribution. However, I want to have them somehow transformed. And one can show, now if I define a new random variable, yeah, to be sigma times x plus mu, then using the transformation formula, for example, or actually just using the formulas from our Gaussian lecture, yeah, I can show that the, the x is now distributed according to mu and sigma squared. Okay, so that is exactly what I need. This is the transformation that I need to generate now a Gaussian distribution with a certain mean. Does it make sense? Yes, it makes sense because the mean was zero and I'm adding a mu. Okay, so I'm shifting it towards. What about the sigma? Why not sigma squared? That's kind of interesting. However, um, if you think about it, the general formula of a linear transformation of a Gaussian was like a matrix A times some vector x. And then the covariance was changed by multiplying the A from the left and from the right hand side of the existing covariance matrix. So in principle, we are squaring the A, okay? And so that makes more sense then to have it like that. Okay, so here's my sample Gaussian function. It, it takes the number of samples I want. Okay, so that is rand n. And then I'm I'm shifting it with my mu and I'm multiplying it with the square root of sigma 2, where sigma 2 is always sigma squared for me. Okay? Great. So here's the test. So how am I testing my code? I'm giving a mean, I'm giving a variance, I'm generating data, lots of it, and then I'm calculating the sample mean and the sample variance, and I compare whether it's the parameters that I put in. Yeah? And you always have to do it like that. Yeah? When you write code, please write it and then write test code that checks whether your function is doing it right. There are so many possibilities of getting things wrong. So let's do it wrong, okay? So let's write it like that. So it could be true, but then we see immediately, okay, 25. Oh, that, that sounds like it's, it's too large, right? So let's make it smaller. Let's use the square root. Um, of course, we could also make it smaller in different ways. Whatever, let's try something else. Divide by five. Oh, that was too much. Okay, so let's divide by three. Oh, we're getting there. Um, divide by four. Oh, no, less, right? Okay, this is right. This is, looks okay. Yeah, it's close. So I could trust that one. Let's try another one. Let's take the variance of 10. Oh, we are off again. Okay, and there you see that it's kind of wrong. But in principle, this is test-driven development, right? So that's a way to approach a problem. However, thinking about the units, yeah, you might see that you should, you should take the square root of sigma squared, because sigma squared is measured in meter squared. And now you're multiplying it with a unitless distribution that is only between 0 and 1, and it should get unit meters, right? So you should multiply it with the square root. And it works in that case, okay? Okay, maybe that was simple. I just wanted to get the point across. Always test your code. Everyone does it, right? Maybe no one talks about it and they only report the function at the end, but always have test code. Ideally, put it into your notebook where you, where you wrote the code. Okay, next one. So let's calculate this integration. And so here it is. It's from zero to infinity and then from x to infinity, okay? 
So the x is bound by the outside integration, like here, so I can use it for the inside integration. Um, for the y. So the y should be from x to infinity and the x should go from 0 to infinity. Of two Gaussians, yeah, this is like having two beta distributions. Oh, we can also rewrite it using Iverson brackets. Yeah, I like Iverson brackets, so now we have integration from minus infinity to plus infinity. It's the same thing, and the difficulty here is whether it's 0 less than y less than x or whether it's 0 less than x less than y. So I had to think about it 10 minutes. And then I think I got it right. And if it's not right, put it into the chat. OK, so that is the integral I want to calculate. Um, I define the parameters of my means. I generate 1,000 samples. OK, and then I can already do some nice plotting. OK, this is just plotting my samples. I, I like this, this um, Plotly library. I don't know. Is it Plotly? I think it is. Yes. I like that one. Looks good. But here comes integration. Let's sample really a lot of points. And then we ask, uh, we're just calculating the mean of the logical end of x being greater to 0 and x being less than y. OK, so the logical end is now calculating the end of this question and that question. OK? So it's just the right thing. So actually, what I want to calculate is. 0.0, .0 less than or equal, less than a y, and I want to calculate the mean of that one. But uh, it doesn't allow me to do it, right? So that's why I had to use this logical end. The logical end looks a bit ugly, but the thing is, the x is a numpy vector. So I need to use some special numpy functions for this. And the special numpy function is logical end. Um, you might worry, uh, wonder why it's written such a way. Yeah, that's. Uh, so maybe I should, should change the code. So I should maybe say import numpy as np, OK? And then maybe the code is more clear. So my, my PhD students want to convince me that it's better to write it like this. OK, then it's clear where the function comes from. So it's from the numpy library. And if you evaluate it, you get some number. Again, great, that's the answer. I put it into my solution sheet. No, you shouldn't stop here. You should look at the picture and you think whether 0 0.15 is a reasonable result, right? First of all, the integration of two densities against some function which can be only 0 or 1, yeah, it should be a number between 0 and 1, OK? So it shouldn't be minus 15 or it shouldn't be plus 17, OK? So it should be between 0 and 1. Now, if 0 0.15, is it in the right ballpark? Yeah, so is it in the right area? Um, yeah, OK, let's say the whole thing is uniformly distributed. OK, then here's another triangle, and here's another one and another one. So it's like something like 0 0.25, maybe approximately. But I'm more shifted towards the outskirts of my Gaussian distribution. Sure, it should be smaller than a quarter, yeah? But it shouldn't be too small, yeah? OK, so the result looks good. Everything is fine. Um, now, what's happening if I make fewer samples? I get the same result, but with a bigger error. OK, so let's say I'm repeating this. How can I repeat it? OK, so those are all now repeated samples. And you see that it's kind of um, jumping around it. So if I would increase this one, Ah, now the first two digits almost always stay the same. Yeah, let's put another zero in here. Now you see the first two, almost the first three digits, they almost stay the same. Yeah, so you get a feeling how this thing works. OK? By the way, um, we are Bayesian here, right? So we are deriving, uh, we, we are assuming a prior distribution, like these two Gaussians. And then we have our statement, and this, this is answering our question whether we buy with this seller or the other seller. And then we derive the posterior distribution, we plug it into the integration, and we're calculating the posterior predictive um, estimate here for our numbers. So we are Bayesian. So however, the thing with Bayesians is often you can't calculate it because the math gets too complicated. However, if it's low dimensional, we can do numerical integration. And then it can be very nice. OK? Great. So far, so good. What else? Any questions about it? Not yet. 
Okay, then I think um, we don't start with linear regression. Yeah? Instead, we do it next time. Um, let me just show you once more our probabilistic inference general recipe. Yeah? So the general recipe, like with these sellers or with some other questions, now this is real life. You have some story, yeah? you have some situation where you want to make a decision. Let's say you want to estimate how many votes um, some presidents get in the next election, or you want to estimate how many votes, whatever, the Green Party gets, or you want to estimate uh, who will be the world champion, like in soccer, if you, fo if you look at it. Maybe you don't want to look at it this, this time, but so if you, or you could also do Bundesliga. You could now have estimations how Union Berlin is playing against all other teams for the rest of the season. Yeah, you put in some prior distribution, and you put in the one point that you measured from the Hinrunde. Okay, and this is changing your, your prior beliefs that you had before the Bundesliga starts. And you have these posterior distributions for all the games of the Rückrunde. Okay? And then you can estimate how likely is it that Union Berlin becomes the, the big thing. Doesn't, don't they get like a big plate or something, Bundesliga? Yes, I think they get a big plate. Um, so how likely is it? And you could answer this question. Or you could answer the question, how likely is it that Borussia Dortmund will be higher ranked than Schalke 04? You could also calculate that one. Okay? That is similar to saying, do I trust that seller more than the other seller? Okay? Now, suppose you want to become rich. Yeah, you can now use your super duper Bayesian super skills and bet money on these, on these um, soccer teams. Right? I'm not saying that you should do it. But um, just in, in principle, uh, decisions in companies are similar. Right? You have two products. So, or let's say you are the new owner of Twitter. And then they are like, uh, two features. Should we implement this? What is it? Twenty dollars per month feature, premium something, or should we add, uh, should we add an edit button to the tweet thing? So what would gain us more uh, more people who like to use like Twitter? Okay, and you can put prior distributions on this one. You have some data. Maybe you did some A/B tests before, and you have some information. You get posterior distributions, and then you could say, see. So what is giving me better revenue? Okay. So this is very, very practical. However, you have to specify a prior distribution, which is typically what a classical statistician doesn't want to do, right? As a classical statistician, I want to have estimators and I want to prove things about them that should be exactly right always, no matter how bad the data is. With a prior distribution, it's a bit arbitrary. And let's say I'm a Bayesian. I must admit, I choose them in such a way that the math is nice. Yeah? Or are they my prior beliefs? Somewhat, yeah. I try to use the ones that are nice mathematically to model my beliefs, right? But I wouldn't be, I would rather have nice mathematics, yeah, than, and then be able to do calculations than to exactly model my beliefs, right? I mean, what are my beliefs anyway? So it's not so easy to specify. Um, so that is what you pay for. And then you run the likelihood thing, which is kind of now m pushing new data into your, so updating your beliefs using the likelihood. And then you have a posterior. If you don't like the idea of a prior, OK, start with the likelihood estimation, yeah, and then use the likelihood information to generate a prior. And tomorrow you'll be a Bayesian. Okay? So somehow you need to, you could have a start with some other estimates. And then that is your start. So you could have a point estimate with maximum likelihood, for the better distribution, yeah, uh, not with the better distribution. For your Bernoulli distribution, you take a point estimate with maximum likelihood, and you say, and next week I'm a Bayesian, so I now take a better distribution where I take the maximum likelihood estimate as the first mean, and like the variance I'm kind of do by eyeballing, and then I collect more data. Okay, so that's like the a reasonable way to do. Then what you can do afterwards is you can take the map or the mode of the distribution, and that is something easy to understand, and you have another estimator. However, danger, danger zone, it's a bit arbitrary. It depends on the um, parameterization that you have. Better is that you look at the posterior predictive distribution, which looks, sounds a bit complicated, but that was the thing with the sellers, so that you really calculate either a loss function or you calculate a, a, um, some Boolean statement like seller 1 is better than seller B. So 
So that is probabilistic in inference. And in a way, it's similar to logical inference, because like the prior part and the likelihood part is like defining your theory, yeah? and then you do inference by running a calculus. However, the calculus that we are running is Bayes' rule. That's it. There's only one. Okay. Good. So far, so good. Um, let's end right now, and next time we are doing linear regression. So thanks for your attention.